Chapel and to see so many familiar faces and to join in fellowship with you, as well as to be able to get an opportunity to minister to you in God's word here. Um, the last couple of years, uh, I've been getting the opportunity to come here and preach uh, to you. Uh, we've been looking at uh, Samson's story, his account in the Bible in the book of Judges, uh, specifically at the three chapters of uh, chapter 14, 15, and 16 that looks at his early adulthood. Um, we learn from the decisions that he made, some of the sinful decisions that he made, the consequences of those sinful decisions, as well as um, how God would use those consequences to propel him into actually fulfilling his God-given purpose. As we talked about before, Samson never really pursued his God-given purpose. It was out of the consequences of his sinful decisions that the Lord was able to lead him into actually fulfilling his God-given purpose, which was to begin to deliver Israel from the hand of the Philistines. So today we will continue. We finally reach chapter 16. Now I will let you know we are not going to look at the entire chapter. There's a lot of stuff going on there, but we are going to focus on a few key points. We're just going to look at the first three verses and then look at other portions of scripture to see um, some supporting scriptures to those key points in Judges chapter 16, uh, looking at verses 1 to 3. So I'll ask that you turn there in your Bibles. We'll read that portion of scripture, and then we'll ask for the Lord's help as we consider uh, this uh, portion of scripture, all right? So Judges chapter 16, beginning at verse 1, it is written, Now Samson went to Gaza and saw a harlot there and went into her. When the Gazites were told, Samson has come here, they surrounded the place and lay in wait for him all night at the gate of the city. They were quiet all night, saying, In the morning, when it is daylight, we will kill him. And Samson lay low till midnight. Then he arose at midnight, took hold of the doors of the gate of the city and the two gateposts, pulled them up, bar and all, put them on his shoulders, and carried them to the top of the hill that faces Hebron. Let us just pray and ask for the Lord's help as we consider this portion of scripture. Dear God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your holy, precious word, which is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Lord, help us, as uh, it says in James' epistle, not to be hearers of the word only, but doers of your word as well, applying what we have learned from scripture to our lives. Lord, help me now as uh, we consider this portion of scripture to be able to um, that I will be able to effectively communicate and share that which you've laid on my heart to share. And we ask these things in your son, Jesus Christ, holy and precious name. Amen. <coughs> you know, according to Selena Cristeria, who is a Christian uh, blogger, to pursue your full potential is to experience the fullness of who you were created to be. And from Samson's account in scripture, we learn in Judges chapter 13 that Samson was predestined by God to be a judge and a deliverer of his people, the Israelites. And he was created to be a judge of Israel and to begin to deliver them out of the hand of the Philistines. That's who he was created to be. And oftentimes when reflected on Samson's story and his account, Many people point out the fact that he didn't really live up to his full potential because of the sinful choices that he made in his lifetime. And while that assessment of Samson is accurate, I would also have to argue that we all do not uh, do not actually reach our full potential because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We are all imperfect beings. So we have to be careful not to fall into the trap that some do in comparing ourselves and our faithfulness to God with other people's faithfulness to God. This was the exact uh, mistake that the Pharisee made who prayed a self-righteous prayer to God in the temple when he was comparing himself to the tax collector. Um, we see that story in Luke chapter 18 verses nine to 14. The Pharisee said, God, I thank you. I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. 
and the tax collector standing afar off would not as much raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus said that the tax collector went down to his house justified rather than the Pharisee who was self-righteous. The Pharisee was self-righteous and exalted himself over others while the tax collector was humble and realized his righteousness were as filthy rags to God. He didn't rely on his own filthy righteousness, but he traded that in for the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. Just like all of us who know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we know that we have all sinned and that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God through Jesus Christ is eternal life. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, the Apostle Paul wrote, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So in a sense, we all do not live up to our full potential here on earth. According to John C. Maxwell, awareness plus ability plus the choices that we make equals our potential. So our potential is all about possibilities based on our abilities and the choices that we make in life. Self-awareness helps us in this process of fulfilling one's potential because when we are aware of our abilities and the consequences of our choices, that leads us into the ability to make better decisions here on earth, which will result in better outcomes for our lives. In his lifetime, not only did Samson not pursue his God-given purpose or peace with all men, but he also didn't pursue his full potential. And today, we will see various examples of how he didn't pursue his full potential for purity and faithfulness to God. And we'll consider a few things that we should do if we're going to pursue our full potential for purity and faithfulness to God. The first thing I want you to see is actually in verse one. So um, we'll read it again. It says, now Samson went to Gaza and saw a harlot there and went into her. The first thing we see here is Samson's sin. Samson struggled throughout his life with lust and sexual sin. Remember in Judges chapter 14, verses one to three, that Samson saw a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines, and he told his parents that he wanted them to get her for him to be his wife. Samson's parents objected to this idea, and his father pointed out the fact that there were plenty of women for him to choose from, from the daughters of his brethren, from their own people. But Samson didn't heed his parents' instruction. Instead, he persisted in his pursuit of sin and partnership with a pagan woman. In Judges chapter 14, verse 3, Samson said to his father, get her for me, for she pleases me well. Remember that it was a sin for God's people, the Israelites, to marry pagan women because they didn't worship the one true God. And by joining them in partnership, they would uh, lead them astray into serving idols. From the text, we see that Samson's struggle with sin and temptation started with the lust of the eyes. The text says that he saw a woman and immediately he pursued her as a wife without knowing anything about her except for the fact that she was from Timna and the fact that she was physically uh, attractive to him. In Genesis chapter three, verses six and seven, it says, so when the woman saw the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, made themselves coverings. Just like the first sin committed by Eve, Samson chose to have what was pleasant to his eyes rather than what was pleasant to God or pleasing to God. And just like the first sin committed by Adam, Samson chose what was forbidden rather than listening to what was permissible through God's command. He had an abundance to choose from that God had blessed them with. He had an abundance of uh, women he could have chose to be his wife from the uh, daughters of his brethren. 
In the Garden of Eden, there was a, an abundance of trees with fruits on them that Adam and Eve could have chose to eat from, right? Except for the, gar, uh, the tree that was in the midst of the garden with the forbidden fruit, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was off limits. In a similar fashion, Samson had many options to choose from, but instead he did not heed the instruction of his uh, father and he did not listen to the Lord's uh, law, but he chose to persist in the pursuit of pleasure and sinfulness rather than choose an obedience to God, which is pleasing God. So in order for us to pursue our full potential for faithfulness to God and purity, we need to walk by faith and not by sight. We need to walk by faith and not by sight. You know, uh, the Apostle Paul mentioned this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. He says, for we walk by faith and not by sight. And in that passage, he was actually referring to our glorification when we'll be physically transformed from, in, from uh, perishable beings to imperishable beings, when we shall put on new immortal bodies, uh, when we see the Lord Jesus Christ face to face, we shall be like him, right? In terms of our new bodies that we shall receive, our new heavenly bodies. That is our hope, which is our certain expectation of an unrealized reality. And we have faith, total trust in this because God has told us this would happen in his word. And as it says in 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 56, God's word never fails. And we also have the guarantee, which is God's Holy Spirit who resides in us as a down payment of the redemption of our total being and bodies. We see this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5, and Ephesians chapter 1, verse 14. We also see the Apostle Paul say in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18, he says, while we do not look at things which are seen, but at things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And in Hebrews 11, verses 24 to 27, it is written, By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he looked to the reward, by faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. We see that Moses, by faith, responded to God's commands as though he saw the invisible God with his very own eyes. Faith is entrusted in the unseen as if we were, we were, they were seen because we know that it is true because God's word has told us so and God's word never fails. You know, in John chapter 20, verses 24 to 29, we see the example of um, Thomas, right? One of the disciples of the Lord Jesus. They call him Doubting Thomas, right? He didn't believe that the Lord Jesus was resurrected when um, the other disciples saw the Lord Je resurrected Lord Jesus and they came back and told Thomas he did not believe. In fact, he said, unless I see his hands, the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And eight days later, Jesus appeared again to his disciples and this time Thomas was there. And he told Thomas to look at his hands, to touch his hands and to uh, put his fingers in the print of the nails and to look at his sides and to touch it with his hands. And Jesus told him, do not be unbelieving, but believing. And in John 20, verse 29, Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have believed. Faith is believing what God has said, even though we may not see it and even though we may not fully understand it. Proverbs chapter 3, verses five to six says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Unfortunately, Samson, 
like many Christians, had several points in his life when he didn't fully trust in the Lord, but instead he leaned on his own understanding and did not acknowledge the Lord's command, but did what was right in his own eyes. In fact, in every single chapter of Samson's early adulthood, chapters 14, 15, and 16, they all start off with Samson making the sinful decision of pursuing partnership and pleasure with pagan women. In Judges chapter 14, verse 1, we see that Samson saw a woman, and in Judges 14, verse 2, that he pursued her as a wife. In Judges 15, verse 1, we see that Samson still pursued a pagan wife by attempting to go into her room and to go into her, despite the fact that she had betrayed him. And here in Judges chapter 16, we see Samson saw a harlot in Gaza and went into her. So we see Samson's pursuit of pleasure with pagan women, whether it was with a pagan wife or with a prostitute, was initiated by the lust of the eyes, followed by the lust of the flesh and the pride of life. So Samson, the man of faith, who gets an honorable mention in the hall of faith in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32, he didn't walk by faith when it came to his interactions with women. Instead, he chose to walk by sight when it came to his interactions with women. He didn't care what God's law said. He only cared that the women looked good and that they pleased him well, that they were pleased into the eyes and pleased into the flesh. Second Corinthians chapter five, verses nine and 10, the apostle Paul wrote, therefore we make it our aim, whether present or absent to be well-pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. We must fight against the urge to please ourselves at the expense of pleasing God. For to please ourselves at the expense of pleasing God is sin, selfish, and prideful, as well as idolatrous. It is putting our will and our desires above God's will and God's desire for our lives. And we know that the root of all sin is pride, selfishness, and idolatry. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 6 to 15, the Apostle Paul speaks about this fact, saying, Now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. And do not become idolaters as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 fell. Nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents. Nor complain as some of them complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore, let him thinks he stands, take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But with the temptation, God will make the way of escape that you also may be able to bear it. Therefore, beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men, judge for yourselves what I say. After the Apostle Paul listed all the various sins the Israelites committed while wandering in the desert, he warns the Corinthians to flee from idols. Pointing out the root of all sin, or as Timothy Keller likes to say, the sin beneath the sin, which is idolatry. Whatever we are seeking first before God is an idol. Matthew 6, 33 says, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Many of the people, places, and things that people make idols in their lives are not necessarily bad things in and of themselves. When Jesus said this quote in Matthew chapter six, he was speaking about food, drink, and clothing, 
all necessities of life, things that we need. He tells us not to worry about these things, but to seek first the kingdom of God, and these things will be added onto us also. Unfortunately, many people, even Christians, have made things idols by placing their importance over God's word, God's will, and his righteousness. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 27 to 28, the Apostle Paul said this, Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be loose. Are you loose from a wife? Do not seek a wife. But even if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. Nevertheless, such will have trouble in the flesh. But I would spare you. And in 1 Corinthians 7, verses 8 to 9, he said, but I say to the unmarried and to the widows, it is good for them if they remain even as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Paul said this to those unmarried Christians in Corinth, do not seek a wife. And he explains why, and actually in that same chapter, in verses 29, 32, and 33. Verse 29, he says, but this I say, brethren, the time is short, so that from now on, even those who have wives should be as though they had none. Verse 32, but I want you to be without care. He who is unmarried cares for the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. Verse 33, but he who is married cares about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. Now, I'll say this. Seeking a wife is not the same as getting a wife. I'll say it again, seeking a wife is not the same thing as getting a wife, right? See, sometimes people, even Christians, can make seeking a wife become an idol because they're putting that first above seeking God and his righteousness. Paul, so, Paul here in this passage is also stating the fact that singles have more time to be fully devoted to the Lord's work than married couples do. And Samson, if we're looking at Samson's life, when he was seeking a wife back in Judges chapter 14, he was committing the sin of idolatry because he was put in seeking a wife above seeking God and his righteousness. He wasn't even pursuing his God-given purpose at all in life, but he was pursuing uh, marrying a pagan woman. And to make matters worse, right, not only was he seeking a wife, but he was seeking a pagan wife, right? One that was not according to God's will. For some like Samson, seeking a spouse has become an idol for them. The Apostle Paul said to singles that we shouldn't seek a wife, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't desire a wife and um, that we shouldn't want a wife, but they sh that we should trust God to provide a wife for us if it is his will. You know, some are called to singleness and some are called to marriage. I mentioned earlier in this series that the first problem in the world was not sin. In fact, the first problem in the world for man was solitude. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. The first problem was that man was alone, and the solution for that problem by God was to make woman to be a helpmate for man. To put things into context now in our current dispensation of the church age, we have the helper who is the Holy Spirit who resides inside of us. Jesus said in John chapter 14, verses 16 to 18, and I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you, and we will be in you. I will not leave you orphans, I will come to you. So while Christians may be single, some are single, right? He or she is not alone in this age because we have the Holy Spirit residing inside of us. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, we see that some are called to marriage and some are called to singleness. And as we see in scripture, singles are not to seek a spouse, but trust God to provide a spouse for us if it is God's will. You know, Tony Evans said this, 
Christian singles should be waiting on the Lord and working for the Lord before they are wed in the Lord, if it is his will. Now, you know, sometimes when I mention 1 Corinthians chapter 7 about this passage, I get a little pushback, right? Um, some people will mention Proverbs chapter 18, verse 22, and I'm sure you're all familiar when we read when I read it, it says, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord, right? The text mentions this fact that God blesses some with a wife, right? But it doesn't say that they sought wives here. And then another passage that people bring up when I mention 1 Corinthians chapter 7, they go back to the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 24, right? When Abraham and his eldest servant sought a wife for Isaac after his mother died. And I believe this points out the fact that solitude isn't a good thing, and this was prior to the church age. Now that we have the Holy Spirit always present with us and in us, we are called to fellowship and friendship with God's people, the church. Solitude shouldn't be a problem for single Christian due, due to these facts, but unfortunately it is, and that's another message for another day, right? But in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 29, 32, and 33, the Apostle Paul points out how a married individual spouse can become an idol when they put pleasing their spouse above pleasing God. In Luke 14, verse 26, Jesus said this, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Meaning that in comparison, our love for God, our love for ourselves and others shouldn't be anywhere closer or greater than our love for God. Meaning that we need to be willing to sacrifice any of these relationships in order to follow God and to please him. Remember that God tested Abraham in this way in Genesis 22, when he commanded Abraham to take his son Isaac to uh, Moriah to offer him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that God would tell him to do it. And we know the story, Abraham was obedient to God's command and willing to sacrifice his son. Hebrews 11 verses 17 to 19 says, by faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, in Isaac your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. So in order for us to pursue our full potential for purity and faithfulness to God, we need to walk by faith and not by sight. In Matthew chapter 5, 28, Jesus said, but I say to you, that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So we see that even before Samson committed the physical act of sin, he had already sinned in his heart by lusting for the pagan woman. In Job chapter 31, verse 1, Job said, I have made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I look upon a young woman? So in order for us to pursue our full potential for purity and faithfulness to God, we need to make a covenant with our eyes not to look at others with lust in our hearts. In Matthew 6, 22 to 23, Jesus said, the lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? When we fix our eyes on Jesus and his will, then we will walk in the light as he is in the light. But if we look back at the things of this world and self-serving desires, then we will fall into sin by giving in to temptation. So we need to fight against the lust of the eyes by walking by faith and not by sight, as well as making a covenant with our eyes not to look at others with lust in our heart. So in verse one, we see Samson's sin. Let us look at verse two. It says, when the Gazites were told, Samson has come here 
They surrounded the place and lay in wait for him all night at the gate of the city. They were quiet all night saying, in the morning when it is daylight, we will kill him. Here we see Samson's snare. Samson's snare, a snare is a trap or a bait. In Judges chapter two, verses one to three, the angel of the Lord told the Israelites that he would no longer drive out the inhabitants of the promised land because the Israelites had refused to obey God and drive them out of the land. So the Lord said, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall be thorns in your side and their God shall be a snare to you. Now we fast forward here in Judges chapter 16, verse two, and we see the Gazites who were Philistines try to trap Samson, who they surrounded with the goal of killing him. Samson was in a perilous situation here. He had been spotted or even maybe even set up by the prostitute. Anyway, what we do know for sure is that the Philistines were alerted at uh, Samson's location um, and his whereabouts, and they surrounded him, waiting for him to leave so that they could ambush him and eventually kill him. What's important to note here is that sin easily ensnares us, entangles us, or trips us up. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 lets us know this fact. So in order for us to pursue our full potential for faithfulness and purity, we need to lay aside every weight and sin that so easily besets us or ensnares us or traps us up or trips us up. Sexual immorality was the sin that so easily ensnared Samson, and he would have to lay aside any weight and sin and that specific sin and he would need to lay it aside in order for him to pursue his full potential for faithfulness to God and purity. The problem was that Samson, like some Christians, didn't make it his aim or goal in life to be found well-pleasing by the Lord. But instead, he persisted in his selfish pursuits and seeking the passing pleasures of sin. So in order for us to be able to pursue our full potential, we should lay aside any weight or sin that so easily ensnares us. And then finally, let us look at verse three. It says, and Samson lay low till midnight. Then he arose at midnight, took hold of the doors of the gate of the city and the two gate posts, pulled them up bar and all, put them on his shoulders and carried them to the top of the hill that faces Hebron. Here we see Samson's strength. So we see Samson's sin in verse one, Samson's snare in verse two, and here in verse three, Samson's strength. You know, oftentimes when I hear messages about Samson, people say that Samson was physically strong and spiritually weak. I'm sure you guys have heard that before. Samson was physically strong and spiritually weak. And I agree with that statement conceptually, but I, I don't necessarily agree with the terminology. And I'll explain why. Throughout Samson's account, in uh, Judges chapter 14 to 16, up to this point in the text in Judges 16 verse uh, three, we have seen four instances in where Samson's strength is exhibited, not included in this instance right here with the Gazites. And in all but one of those instances, the text mentions that the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon Samson. We saw that the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon Samson in verse uh, 14 for him to tear the young lion apart in two as if he was ripping apart a young goat with his bare hands. Again, the spirit of the Lord came mightily up upon Samson, enabling him to kill the 30 Philistine men in Ashkelon when he took their apparel off their backs to pay off his debt to the uh, 30 Philistine companions at his wedding feast. And again, the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon Samson when the 1,000 Philistine men came charging against him, he was able to pick up the jawbone of a donkey and slay all 1,000 Philistine men. So when that happened, we see that Samson was able to accomplish these great feats in battle due to the spirit of the Lord coming mightily upon him. And the same thing can be said about Samson's feat of thwarting the Gazites' plans here in this chapter. By picking up the gate of the city, the two gate posts, bar and all, putting it on his shoulders, and carrying them to the top of the hill that faces Hebron. 
The text doesn't mention here in uh, verse 3 that the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon Samson. It doesn't say that, but we know that Samson was only able to accomplish this feat due to God's strength upon his life. God was the source of Samson's strength, not himself. In fact, we see later on in this chapter, we won't really look there today, but we see, we know from scripture later on in this chapter, when the spirit of the Lord had left Samson due to his persistent sinfulness and his hair being cut off, which was the Nazarite vow and a symbol of his, uh, a symbol of that vow with the Lord, we see that the spirit of the Lord left him and in his own strength, he was unable to overpower the Philistines. In his own strength, he was actually weak. So I believe in saying that he was physically strong and spiritually weak is inaccurate um, in a terminology sense. I believe he was actually spiritually strong, but physically weak because his, the source of his strength came from God himself. That's a spiritual thing. He wasn't really able to accomplish that in his own strength. So I understand when people say that, what they're communicating. So I agree with the concept, but the terminology I think is reversed. He was actually spiritually strong, but physically weak in his own flesh, like any one of us. Samson was spiritually strong, not in anything that he had done, but because of God's providence, election, and grace upon his life. Samson was able to fulfill his God-given purpose because of God's supernatural power upon his life, which empowered him to fulfill his, uh, his duty to begin to deliver Israel from the hand of the Philistines. We see in Judges 16, 20 to 21, in his own strength, that he couldn't overpower those Philistines, but he was bound and his eyes were gouged out. Those same, same very eyes that would get him in trouble, that he would fall into the lust of the eyes, right? And, you know, another thing that people say is that Samson was spiritually blind, right? But he had physical sight. I, I hear that as well. And I also, again, agree with the concept of what people are saying there. But again, I think the terminology, um, I, I don't use that because, you know, whenever scripture mentions people who are spiritually blind, it's talking about people who do not belong to God, people who are not believers. And what we know from scripture, uh, Samson was belong to God. He was chosen by God to be a judge and a deliverer of uh, the Israelites. So I wouldn't say he was spiritually blind, but I agree with the concept. What I would say is that he was spiritually immature. He didn't really grow much spiritually because he was always pursuing the past and pleasures of sin rather than pursuing his God-given purpose. And God as we see from scripture, would use the consequences of his sin to actually get Samson to fulfill his God-given purpose, which was to begin to deliver Israel from the hand of the Philistines, which points out God's faithfulness and not necessarily Samson's faithfulness, right? God is faithful and it showed, points to God's providence and election that Samson was always going to begin to fulfill his God-given ministry of delivering, beginning to deliver Israel from the hand of the Philistines because God said it would happen. Despite all the sinful decisions that he made in his life, since God said it was going to happen, it was going to happen. And there was no sin, no bad decision that Samson could commit that was going to change that fact that God said it was going to happen and it happened just as God said it would. So, if we're going to pursue our full potential for God, in order for us to uh, pursue our full potential for purity and faithfulness to God, we need to set our minds on doing God's will and not our own will. In Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, the Apostle Paul wrote, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So while Samson didn't pursue his full potential for purity and faithfulness to God, he still had the potential to do so because of his ability given to him by God. 
The same power of the Holy Spirit that God gave Samson to kill a lion, to kill the 30 Philistine men in Ashkelon, and to kill the 1,000 Philistine men with the jawbone of a donkey, is the same power that Samson could have chosen to use by faith to resist the temptation of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life that led him down the path of sexual immorality and sin. We have the power of God, the Holy Spirit resided in us today. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 4, the apostle Peter said, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped corruption that is in the world through lust. God has given us the power to live holy lives that are pleasing to him, just like he gave Samson the power to live a life that was pleasing to him. It is up to us by faith to choose to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit given to us by God and when we do so, we shall not gratify the lust of the flesh, as it says in Galatians. So in order for us to pursue our full potential for purity and faithfulness to God, we need to walk by faith and not by sight. We need to make a covenant with our eyes not to look at others with lust. We need to lay aside every weight and sin that so easily ensnares us. And we need to set our minds on doing God's will and not our own. These are just a few things that we need to do if we're going to pursue our full potential for purity and faithfulness to God. Amen. Amen. Let us just pray. Dear God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you've done for us. We thank you that we are chosen by you, Lord, because in our own selves, we would not choose you. Actually, Jesus said in his word, I chose you. That's what he says. You did not choose me, but I chose you. He said that to his disciples. So we thank you, Lord, for choosing us and softening our hearts, Lord, to be able to accept you as Lord and Savior. Help us, Lord, to walk in the power of your Holy Spirit that we will not gratify the lust of the flesh. We talked about sin today, even in the breaking of bread. No temptation has overtaken us as is common to man, but you are faithful who with the temptation also makes the way of escape that we may be able to bear it. We thank you, Lord, for that way of escape you make for us. And we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, and his perfect sacrificial and substitutionary death on the cross for us. And we thank you that we are righteous because we believe in him, not in anything that we do in ourselves, but because of his precious blood and sacrifice for us. In your son Jesus Christ's holy and precious name we pray, amen.